Good afternoon. I would like to remind you to cultivate Bodhicitta. We are continuing the topic of the mind is, and then the mind uh, is a devoid of mind, and because the mind is the clear light. So the topic this afternoon is a still we are sticking on the the mind and is clear light. It is very helpful this quotation um, that is from the Minerva Doha. Uh, it's a very uh, <coughs> profound and then as well as a very uh, helpful if you um, um, understand this. So therefore, in Tibetan it's called Tao Zersum, Gombe Zersum, Jebe Zersum, and Devu Zersum, which means in English that is the, the describe, to describe the nails, <coughs> nails, the related, the nails related to view, and uh, to describe the nails of uh, meditation, to describe the nails of conduct, and to describe the nails of uh, nails that go with the result. The nails related to view, there is a three, three, three nails, which are the the first. He says that all phenomena, the all phenomena is within the mind. So this shows that the, the phenomena that is the samsara, the phenomena that is the nirvana. So whatever appears to you is nothing separate from your mind. So this means that is your mental projection. Which means in Tibetan the word rang hang. The rang hang means the tang means appearance or the vision. So whatever vision, whatever appearances are the self arising. Means the self arising from your own mind. It's from within, not from outside. Our problem or the samsara begins that one fixates to the things that appears to you that you strongly believe or mistakenly you believe that these are truly existed outside there. It's completely apart from your mind. Therefore, third Kamapa in the Mahamudra prayer, it says there, Yu Manyon means never existed outside there. It's not that you have made it outside there, but it is innately, naturally, never ever existed. So, so the Ramhan is a very beautiful word, and uh, even lack of realization, but if you think of this term, Ramhan, self-arising, it gives you relief. Because when you have a tension, when you have a depression, when you have anxiety or suffering, pain, so if you take them seriously, then you will never can get out of these problems at all. Because you are strongly believe the so depression and the anxiety, the sadness are truly there. So you are so strongly believe and you are strongly tied to them, strongly hold them. So therefore, because you yourself make really tight and that you never let you be free yourself. So therefore, the random, the things that in your concept, yeah, the pain is there, the sadness is there, then the hurting is there, but as a teaching, it says that it is not truly there. So it's because of this, uh, the heavy or profound tendency, so that makes us the belief that these are there, so therefore I'm going through the suffering and the pain. So if you think of the Ramdhan, the self-arising, the self-arising is like a dream, it's not truly there. Yeah? So something that you keep telling yourself and uh, kind of uh, reflecting on it, so after some time it really gives you much relief. <coughs> and the uh, pain and the depression and the sadness 
will march, uh, you know, uh, goes uh, um, slowly away, and then you feel much lighter. This is a, um, something how to work with our our daily life. Those great masters in the past, when they uh, show us uh, in the spectrum for say that uh, the the health problem, so. Um, a long time back, like they do those great old uh, masters. So when we ask, you know, so he or she is sick, but when we ask, uh, are you okay? But uh, they will not say I'm okay or not okay, but they say it's, it's a, what about this, uh, mm, illusory human body. So uh, anything can be happened. So this is instruction, uh, it's not show off. Uh, it is instruction, so which means it's not reliable. So today you are healthy, but tomorrow you can be sick. Mm -hmm. And this morning you are healthy, but evening uh, maybe you will sick. But that really doesn't bother him because the fundamental understanding that is an illusion, that is a something not truly there. So it's impermanent. So therefore anything can be happened. So they have a, such a what about this uh, determination. Uh, so, because of this determination, so they can accept when factor comes to them, they really don't mind. Because of the basic, the fundamental understanding, fundamental knowledge that is gained fully, so the, those circumstances really never make them uh, shaky. <laughs> so, this is our practice anyway. Teaching does not mean that you just attend there and uh, it's kind of a fun and you go back, then you just uh, put it aside and then you are still in the problem. So <laughs> there is no practice. So practice means whatever you have heard and whatever you have received the such teaching that you should apply. We have to apply. So when problem comes to you, then you can experience. So whatever instruction that has given, whether it's true or not, you have to prove. I always say, we have to prove. Not that master says. Not that because of my logic says. Not that because of philosophically proved. Or intellectually proved. But we have to prove experientially. That's the best. So therefore, if you don't do that, then, of course, the problem is our everyday life. We can never deny we have it. There is a problem, always, one after another. So today, something different problem. So tomorrow, something very special problem. So day after tomorrow, very, very, very special problem. So the, those are the special a problem comes to us is unexpected. Yeah? So we can't do anything. But we know problem is going to be there, but then how do you accept the problem? How to deal with the problem? So that is our key factor in the practice. So therefore, such instruction saying that all phenomena are within our mind. <coughs> so this tells us that uh, we have to deal with the situation everyday life. Otherwise, uh, if you don't deal through the practice, extensive practice, <coughs> then one cannot experience that the phenomena are really inseparable from your mind. And uh, if you don't practice that, even you keep counting these words, say that all phenomena is from my, all phenomena is not separate from my mind, so it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's for what? So there is no blessing. <laughs> there, there is no power to cure your problem. There is no power to cure your uh, remove your uh, mental problem or physical problem. You know. So there is no blessing. So blessing comes from within, through the practice, through the determination through the confidence. So confidence and the determination can be developed through the wisdom. So for this, you have to open up your mind completely, openly. So then you have to get ready to accept everything as it is. So therefore, it is through the practice, through the dealing with the situation, not through the understanding and the education alone. I'll give you one simple example. We all say anger is no good, and we all know it's so simple, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, nothing to do with the religion. 
nothing to do with the knowledge, nothing to do with the with this, uh, d devotion, nothing to do with the compassion. Everybody knows anger is really disgusting <coughs> because it hurts myself, it hurts others, and the anger never brings a happiness to us at all. Anger destroys our ultimate happiness. Everybody is well known, everybody knows this. But when anger comes to you, <coughs> and you are the one who gets angry. And the Bodhisattva, is now, I have taken Bodhisattva vow, I have been practiced. Every morning I say Sanjay Chodan Soki Chodan Sanjay Bhadu Brother Vinja Sanjay Dhruva Show But when you're all outside, something happened Oh, so you are really cannot control anything So if somebody say Bodhicitta, so you get more, more angry So you don't want to hear the word of a Bodhicitta at that moment you, can, you are very pleasant, you are very happy with the word of bodhicitta when you have no problem. <laughs> but when problem comes to you, you don't want to hear the word of bodhicitta, forget about the practice. <laughs> Why? Because of lack of training, lack of confidence, lack of thorough training, lack of practice. It's not, it's not lack of knowledge, not lack of education. You have a full of education and the knowledge of this, but lack of practice. So that's why, you see, every day in our life and practice, <coughs> we tend to be a um, good practitioner, but many mess up things in our practice, so that we never get through these me the, the, me the mess up things. So therefore, be practiced. The first verse, Nancy Simpson did it that, so it helps you to calm down. Yes. Calm down. So we have to calm down. We are never calm down. So therefore, we need to tame in our mind, the yeah. discipline our mind. <coughs> so then, slowly, you will be uh, able to uh, realize the all phenomena are within our mind. This is not really separate from our mind. Then the second verse, it says, Sini Sali Mangla Da. Which means that what about mind itself? If you say every all phenomena uh, within our mind, then what about the mind itself? Then it says the mind itself is in the state of luminosity. So clear light or clarity. In the luminosity, in the clarity, then all thoughts arises. And then you can experience all thoughts never separate from the luminosity. So, the thoughts do not disturb you. And then you can remain in the concentrative meditation with the full of joy and the full of pleasant with this concentrative meditation because of that the understanding or the realization of the clarity of your mind is there so, when you walk, you are within the clarity. When you eat, and you are also within the clarity of mind. And when you talk with the people, and you are also within the clarity of mind. So all your activities is always within the clarity of mind. Everything functions from the, the luminosity. Then we call you a yogi, or yogi me. So when you say yogi in Tibet, nal jorpa. So nal jor, nal means the natural or unfabricated or very natural. Jor means reach. That means you reach to that state, the state where the state of unfabrication or uh, uncontamination. So you are free from obstruction. So that person is you call yogini or yogi. So really yogi, your mind is completely settled, stabilized. So in this state, even yogi or yogini is asleep. So deep inside in the samadhi rather than the sleep. So from the from the sleeping, so realizes the many uh, practices and meditation, that you can develop meditation, you can develop your practice, compassion, loving kindness, always there. So there is no ordinary activity, 
So we have ordinary activity because we do session in the session. Okay, we tend to be a good practitioner in the session. So you need to close the door, you need to close the window, put a big sign outside the door say that I'm in the session. <laughs> <laughs> and plus, don't disturb me. <laughs> yeah? So nobody dare to disturb you. If somebody knocks the door, then you are not a yogi because you will get angry. So that because you didn't respect me, you think. So really yogi and the yogi need don't mind. Always, always practice. In the sleep, practice. When you eat, also practice. And the talk, also practice. Walk, also practice. So therefore, there is no ordinary activity. All activity, all aspect of life becomes his or her own practice. So that comes from once your mind is unified in the sense of the luminosity and the clarity of mind. But the third verse verse is Dela Musun Mehada. That there is no discrimination or identification. So when we say the clarity, so is it that something that we can identify easily through the description? Through the, through the communication, through the word, through the explanation, through the correspondence? No. If you put it that all in the sense of a communication, description, then that is not luminosity. Luminosity is beyond, far beyond from our <coughs> imagination. So in this dualistic mind, in the dualistic mental state, we cannot perceive the true essence of the, the luminosity. So it is only once that your mind is being free from the obscuration and the duality, then only you can discover the luminosity. Once you discover it, and it is always there, and you can still have your ordinary activities. But it is never separate from the luminosity. Mahayana Uttara Tantra Shastra Jilama by Udhamatriya, he described how profound this the the, uh, the mind of luminosity. He says, "Chajir tere yuminti, to namchina sandemin, chuni sachinji dembe kumbala su yumai." With the three reasons that you cannot perceive. First reason, chajir. That is subtle. It's the subtlest state of mind. <coughs> So that subtlest state of mind you can discover only through the deepest or subtlest concentrated meditation. So that means you have to master it, meditation. So it's a so subtle, therefore you cannot perceive through the, the dualistic study. Tava first. Why subtle? It's not that I'm talking about the subtle, like a, some is, uh, substances is too subtle, <coughs> or like a, uh, or, uh, under atoms or something like that. But because of the subtle, why subtle to you? Because you cannot discover it through the, the analytical research. And you cannot uh, uh, discover through the, the, uh, the intellectual uh, study. And you cannot discover this through the, uh, like a, maybe um, the just a simply uh, spirituality, the way of spirituality. So it is only you can discover through the training of your mind through the meditation. So certain degree of your negative emotion should be reduced actually, you know. And uh, otherwise, in this normal life, with the full of our dual duality and uh, affliction, that uh, you cannot find, you cannot discover this the subtlest state of mind, which is the luminosity. So therefore, very subtle, because only yogis or yoginis can discover it. Second, tanam chinna sambe min is not conventional truth. It is the ultimate truth. It's, it is a completely supreme. 
state of a stream. So therefore, this cannot discover through the dualistic contemplation or reflection. You can do the research. How is the luminosity? You can't. You can't. You can't finalize what is the what is the sense of luminosity. So therefore, luminosity is far beyond than the, than uh, dualistic contemplation. Third, So the Dharma Datu or Chuni. Dharma Datu is so profound. So therefore you cannot discover the Dharma Datu through the dualistic meditation. Meditator, meditation and the things what need to be meditated. So these three notions, if you believe, existed, then we call this a dualistic meditation, which means it's an imperfect meditation. So the perfect meditation should be free from those notions. So one should realize that meditator, meditation is all on just a level. There's nothing to be meditated because you have realized so until that we do meditation, which means we are not good meditator. So although we say we are good meditator because you can meditate for hours and hours, but that is something maybe discipline, <laughs> rather than rather than uh, good meditator. So good meditator should be non-meditation. If you reach at the level of non-meditation state, then you are the best and a superstar <laughs> meditator. <coughs> it is very important to, to understand as such because uh, uh, the, everything that is uh, like uh, the clarity of mind or the, um, the luminosity or the shunyata, these are all far from the description. You cannot put into the word, put into the description. You cannot describe the how the mind is and uh, the characteristic of the mind and the ultimate mind. We call ultimate mind, relative mind, and the, the mind of this and that clarity mind. So we tend to describe many, but we all track inside the a word. So that is also obstacle. So Gampopa asks us, Milarepa, does jhana yeshe exist or not? Milarepa's answer to this question said, don't ask me, what's your mind? So that is, so that's it. So, Tapu Mukampupa says, that's the best answer. <laughs> yes, that's the best answer. Because, which is true, Milarepa cannot describe in the world. Yes, exist a Yeshi, that is also obstacle. <laughs> no, Yeshi is not existed also obstacle. To you, yes. To the practitioner, it's a beyond. The both existed and non-existed. Existence and the non-existence both are our natural <coughs> level. It is a fabrication. It is artificial. It is a not reality at all. So should be free from all those notions and the characteristics and the, the, the circumstances. Then you are within the meditation, true meditation, genuine meditation. From this genuine meditation, then all your activity is the activity of the jhana, the wisdom. Then you can benefit to infinite number of sentient beings in even in a few minutes or in hours. So that's what we call the ultimate power of the mind. So next three nails of a meditation. So those are the three nails of a view. Now next is three the nails of uh, meditation in Tibetan. First, Nanto Chukur Chowarda. Nanto Chukur Chowarda. Which means the <coughs> thoughts liberated into the Dhammakaya. Which means hmm, it's like in the Dzogchen teaching, there is a term they use 
Rangshar Rangjo. It's a very nice word. Of course, it's always nice. Uh, but I ate more here, so very nice. So, because it convinces you. Rangshar Rangjo. Self arising and self liberated. Like you are drawing in the water. You can draw, but it doesn't exist there. So, it's lovely. And also, like a uh, snow, uh, snow, or the ice uh, dissolve once it touches the hot stone. Yeah. So, likewise. So, you see, whole aspect of a meditation, both Mahamudra and the Mahati, they don't convince you be, uh, be con uh, combat the thought or push away the thought. Their instruction is bring thoughts onto, onto the path of enlightenment. Uh, so the thought is so helpful to us if you deal with it carefully. Yes. So therefore, the non thought, the thought, let dissolve into the Dhammakaya or Dhammata whatsoever. So thought arises. Then the power of a meditation uh, makes you realizing its essence and its nature. So the nature is never separated from the luminosity. So in the luminosity, the old thoughts arise, and the minute it liberates. Number two, Torda. Rikshal Devi Mandoda. Rikshal. Rik awareness. The Ripa in Dzogchen tradition. But this you should not mistake with the Siddhartha Mata school. They also are Rangrik they use, but that is different aspect. Here is the Rangrik, is the different Rangjung the self arising awareness. It's similar to the luminosity. And uh, so the awareness is in the clarity mind, is in the clarity, or it's clear. And uh, Dewa is the bliss. So bliss is not that something, the sense of happiness or our ordinary happiness. It's not the something sense of our ordinary joy, but the blissfulness is that once you are able to transform our negative thoughts into the wisdom or jhana, then that state is we call the state of the bliss, the blissfulness. Through the training of our body, that is it very important in the six Naropa doctrines they emphasize on the working with your own body let loose all the tightness of like your nerve systems or the winds or whatever so Tibetan call in the Dharma Tendu Lula Du means that you have to you have to make the interdependence uh, inside your body by the yoga practice. There is a technique that certain movement of body, there is a special instruction for certain movement of your body, so it helps you arise in your self-arising self mind. Because of the body and the mind has very strong the leakage. Lina, Senti, Ndrava. So that is called the relation of the interdependence with the body and the speech. So, and then you go into the deeper, then we explain about that the mind and the air, lung, sen. So there is, that is the much, uh, the deeper level. So what we are not talking about here, it's not a time or so, to me also speak about this. And uh, so that is, I'm here generalizing. So is the awareness, is clarity, and it is in the on the state in the state of the uh, the blissfulness. When he explains so these, it's not like, like it's something three different uh, subject all are together, but explains through the the realization of yogis and yoginis that the function is so beautiful, uh, so they can function uh, whatever. So, and the function itself arises from the power of meditation. So the experience only can experience by these yogis and the yoginis 
and tells us so briefly, but this is only brief. They can't put everything into the word. So we have to be just satisfied whatever we have heard from this. So don't expect further explanation. Then you will attract again, so cause another problem. So therefore, last, what he said, Maju Yambar Shabarada. So that is the, the uh, concise of all the meditation. What we need, we need the rest of mind naturally in the state of non fabrication. If you fabricate, then there is not meditation. Let's say, okay, now I'm meditating emptiness. So there is a fabrication. Or I am meditating bodhicitta. So you are here, bodhicitta is something there, then you try to make it connected to the bodhicitta mind. So there is a very artificial meditation. Of course, it does not mean that you shouldn't do, we have to do. The starting point is from the fabrication. But the, then the while we train our practice and meditation, we have to be free from this non-fabrication. That is the, the system of how we train our mind. Of course, it, the, initially we cannot really jump into the, the non-fabricated meditation at all. We have to start, but then the training means you have to uh, you have to progress in your practice. So if there is no progress, then, which means you are not doing practice well. So progress, so progress in everyday life, we have to, we have to bring every single aspect of your life into the meditation. Then, if you do that, then slowly, the meditation itself helps you to progress. <coughs> The more you walk with the, your mind, the more you can progress. Because the fabrication is not our nature at all. Our nature is free from the fabrication. So if you walk towards, then the, they can sense your, your, your diligence, and they can sense your practice, then automatically they will lead you to the right direction. So this is what we call development. So to those are the three nails of meditation. Now next is the three nails of the conduct. So it is says in Tibetan here, the first is Geju Jube Shurachar. Geju, Gyoju. So that means, here it says that 10 the wholesome deeds are the natural expression of conduct. So you don't need to put effort to do all these. So the power of the meditation, that you are completely unified, or you become your mind completely meditation of the luminosity or clarity, and then these ten, the wholesome deeds, the naturally will be conducted. So you don't need to do individually body, speech, mind, it takes a long time. So by doing this, uh, the practice of meditation, then one can naturally, that you can engage in the ten wholesome deeds, naturally. <coughs> then the next is the Dikju Rangsin Neso Ta. Ten unwholesome deeds will naturally clear into the, its ground. The last is the Nian Pe Satong Jiu Satong, the inseparability of the clarity and the emptiness mind is naturally arising. It's not you can that you cannot uh, you cannot create the expression or experience of the clarity and the emptiness through the antidote or application or some, some practice. So that is a, something naturally arising. Zhu means that you cannot make or you cannot create the, the clarity and the emptiness of mind. So because it is the, as a result of the meditation. So that is the conduct. So conduct is something very special. Without the actualizing the meditation of the luminosity, then every conduct that you do is very ordinary conduct. 
So the benefiting others also very limited, and the benefiting yourself through the conduct also become very limited. So that your conduct cannot uh, unify you with the meditation. So you are always a separate, this two meditation and your conduct. So your conduct is not conduct of your meditation. So effortlessly walking, or effortlessly uh, the walking with your conduct is always the result from the meditation. So this means every conduct you do, physically or verbally, any conduct you do, all are part of meditation. So each and every those conduct that helps you to, to increase, to develop further development, could have further development of your meditation. Usually, in the general instruction of meditation, they ask, sit one place, don't move around because it will disturb your meditation. Right? <laughs> this is common. That's why you are in the retreat. Why you are in the retreat? Because not that because you're scared of your family or job. <laughs> no. But it's, it is because you feel it's not worthy because it's too much destruction. And uh, I have to move, I have to give a speech, I have to talk my family, my friends. So therefore, these conducts are disturbing my meditation and my practice. So the, with that sense, you are running away from your hometown to go into the Himalaya cave. So, so therefore, you don't need to do that. So if you do properly with your meditation, then every day is your retreat. Right? As long as you conduct, if you are able to perform your conduct through the meditation, so that's the best to conduct and that's the best to retreat. Mm. The last is the three nails of result. It says here, that's the beautiful conclusion. So, first is that Nirvana is nothing to be adopted from somewhere else. If you are able to recognize your true nature of mind, so that that is the Nirvana. The nirvana is the state where you are completely safe and you are completely pure and you are completely genuine. So those the circumstances which usually disturb you, which means nirvana is not adopted as yet. So if you are at the stage the where you are totally free from the, the dualistic substances or circumstances, so then you are fully, uh, fully adopted or fully attend the ultimate happiness. So that is your own mind. So that is the Nirvana. Otherwise, if you think the Nirvana is somewhere, you go find the Nirvana. So that is not the Nirvana. The Nirvana is always existed within our mind. Only problem is discovered or not yet discovered. Not yet discovered, you are in the samsara. So the discovered means that no longer the, the samsara. The samsara appears in the form of the nirvana. Then the second is the korwa shendo pangrume. Samsara is nothing to be abandoned somewhere. Because the samsara is the circumstance which you see as a samsara because of your mind is a dualistic. So from the dualistic point of view, the whatever you see, hears, smells are samsara. Why they are samsara? Because these circumstances cause you pain and suffering and dissatisfaction. One after another, endlessly. One comes after another. <coughs> so endlessly we are suckling in this samsara with the full of pain and the suffering and the miseries. So why this cause? Why you call samsara? Samsara is a Sanskrit or it means, means endless suckling. No? Samsara. So therefore your mind is a samsara in the sense of the problem of the pain and the suffering never ceased. So if you switch that dualistic mind into the wisdom, 
or jhana in the reality, then the samsara is ended. So what was that? What is that? That is we call nirvana. So there is no two different notions existing. It's just to your your projection. And then the last word, word is Ramsim Sanchi Sobhacha. So that means I have fully realized that my mind itself is the Buddha. So the Buddha is Tibetan word Changchu. Chang, the purified, will clear away all the negativities. Chu, the realized fully. So that's it. So this is the result of our mind of training. So that is the Changchu. So means that you have to realize your own this very normal mind is Buddha, nothing else, but you have to work with it. Yes. Although your mind is never separate from the, the Buddha, it is always a Buddha at the ground, at the heart, at the fruition. The characteristic of the body never changes, never decline, and never increase. Oh? So it always remains in the the state of the pure gene. But because of the levels of our own, uh, the, the, the mind, so then we call one is the sentient being, ordinary, the one is like the Shavakayana, then the Mahayana, then the Vajrayana, whatsoever. These are all go along with our own practice and the level of our, the mental capacities. But if you are carefully look closely your mind right now, so your mind itself is the Buddha. It's never diluted, never polluted. It is always clear, brilliant and aware. So the possibility to be enlightened tonight is also there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so better get ready. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> we have been completed the, the topic of the consciousness and the wisdom and uh, the teaching of this uh, great the Rafa's Doha uh, this afternoon is uh, very much in, in the aspect of the, the jhana and the wisdom. The Manjushri, uh, this is not really my issue. Uh, <coughs> this is an image. So, uh, but uh, the Manjushri is the embodiment of the wisdom, share of the Buddhas of three tenses. Your excellent mind, the wisdom, is like the sun, the brightness of the sun free from all the obscurations and uh, you are fully realize the true phenomena. Therefore, you are holding the text and uh, you are performing a wonderful teaching or giving the, the speech <coughs> to those beings who are wandering in this the darkness of the samsara. Then you are holding the sword. The sword symbolizes its the wisdom. The sword cut the object. Likewise, the wisdom cut <coughs> the root of samsara. You are naturally or emergently the pure. Not that you have made pure yourself. You are excellent because innately, naturally, you are so pure. You are fully enlightened, yet you pretend you are as a form of Bodhisattva. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pretend, please. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> Why you do this? Because you know our weakness. So therefore, you are in the form of a bodhisattva where we can connect you directly and you can work with us directly so it's very accessible in the form of 
the sword and the text because someone there always remind us the study and don't be ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore I supplicate you, please grant your blessing that make sure the root of my samsara be able to uproot. So please, you are, you have uh, knowledge, you have compassion, you have a power. So you are the form of every qualities. So I have fully trusted you. So uh, give me the power of wisdom that I can realize all the teachings of the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas that have performed from them and uh, that I can eventually overcome this powerful ignorance. So from there, then I'll be able to benefit all sentient beings. So I need your blessing. So blessing that let me arise the perfect wisdom in my mind. That's it. <laughs> That's all. Okay, so thank you so much. So I I was very happy to um, be able to uh, share some of the great the teachings of the, the Mahasiddhas and the great the Masters. And uh, so thank you for your patience. And uh, although I was uh, sometimes talk too much, and maybe so sometimes no meaning, but sometimes there's meaning. <laughs> but anyhow, thank you for your understanding. And uh, I thank you, uh, Mr. Gunta and uh, his wife, Rinjan family, who organized this wonderful event.